Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone out there in Facebook land. Um, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate you taking some time to be with us um, for our conversation on financial literacy and the impacts that financial literacy can have on young folks as they're progressing through uh, their higher education career and beyond. Um, so we have some really wonderful panelists and folks here to talk to you. I just wanted to do a brief introduction um, and let you know what's been going on in Springfield. Um, last week was deadline week in Springfield in the House of Representatives, meaning that any legislation that had hopes of moving to the House floor had to make it through committee by um, last Friday evening. And it was my first um, deadline week and it was really reminiscent of um, a crazy finals week in college. High intensity and high productivity. It was really great. We got a lot done. Um, and I'm proud to say one of the bills that we advanced through the Economic Opportunity and Equity Committee was HB 3131, which is the bill that we are going to talk about today. Um, House Bill 3131 will uh, establish the Equity Through Financial Literacy Task Force um, so that we can take, take a moment and, and pause to really examine our financial literacy curriculum here in Illinois, um, see what folks in um, higher ed are doing to promote financial literacy with our young, young adults. Um, a brief introduction to what financial literacy is. It's really just a basic knowledge of saving and investing and how the economy and financial markets work. And being financial, financially literate is one of the keys to future success and empowerment. And it's always important um, to have some financial literacy, but right now during the economic turmoil of the pandemic, it's increasingly important. Um, being financially literate means you have the skills and understanding to face a financial crisis and improve your odds of getting through it. Something else I think about when we're thinking about financial literacy um, is, is college debt. Um, according to a U.S. News and World Report, uh, in 2019, college grad graduates borrowed an average of around $30,000 for their undergrad education. Um, and that's just an average. So understanding debt and managing money and navigating a budget are critical skills for young people to learn and it, they can really put them on the path to financial success. And I think higher education can play a huge role in preparing our students to make financial choices that allow them to attain career goals, build personal wealth, and better participate in Illinois' economy. HB 3131, which is what we're talking about today, is a, the initiative of a fantastic group called the Young Invincibles. Um, don't worry, I won't just be me talking tonight. I am, will be joined by Morgan Diamond, uh, the Midwest Program Manager of the Young Invincibles, and she'll be on in just a moment to talk to us. But before she does, let me give you a really quick rundown of who we will hear from tonight because we have a great lineup. In just a few minutes, we'll have a fabulous panel of young adults here to talk about the challenges of navigating financial systems. We will have a guest speaker, Rebecca Maxey, from the University of Chicago's Financial Education Initiative. Then you will hear from my friend and colleague, Representative Will Gazzardi, who is a co-sponsor of HB 3131. And finally, we will be wrapping up with a guest speaker, Jeff Badu, to give us tips for young adults and planning for the, their financial future. I am really excited for this lineup, and I'm so glad that you're here um, to, to see this show with me. As always, post any questions you have for our guests and panelists in the chat. We want this to be as interactive as possible, and we are here to help. So we look forward to answering your burning financial questions. Okay, I am going to bring Morgan on so she can tell us a little bit about the Young Invincibles and 3131. Hi, Morgan. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> Um, thank you for having us tonight, and thank you to everyone who is joining us tonight out in Facebook land and YouTube. Um, as Representative Hershauer said, my name is Morgan Diamond, and I'm the Midwest Program Manager at Young Invincibles. If you're not familiar with us, Young Invincibles is a nonprofit policy, advocacy, and research organization dedicated to expanding economic opportunity for young adults 18 to 34 years old. 
As part of our work, we held a focus group last fall and asked young adults what they needed to feel financially secure. A common theme that came up during that conversation was that young adults had a desire to learn more about how to navigate their taxes, onboard, um, complete onboarding documents at work, financial aid, and taking on credit. Because of the concerns that were lifted up during that conversation, we became strong advocates for the creation of the Financial Literacy Task Force. Representative Hirschauer described the task force, um, and we are really excited to see a group of experts as well as young adults with lived experience come together to submit recommendations on how to improve the financial capacity of young adults 18 to 24 years old, especially those who are enrolled in college in two and four year colleges. We believe in the financial literacy task force at Young Invincibles because studies have shown that a lack of financial knowledge can have significant impact on people's lives. For example, in one nationwide survey, Americans estimated that they had lost an average of $1,600 in one year due to a lack of financial literacy. This amount of lost money is particularly impactful for young adults who have some of the highest poverty rates of any age group. Even for young people who may not meet the outdated threshold for poverty, they're still at a critical time in their lives where they're beginning to take on increased financial obligations like student loans, credit cards, and signing contracts like leases for the first time. We need a task force to help us identify what programs will help best prepare young people to manage their finances. Now, one thing we do wanna recognize is that financial education or lack thereof is not the only or main cause of economic inequalities in our country. In the US, the median black family owns just 2% of the wealth than the median white family owns. For Latinx families, it's just 4%. Historical and present day discrimination and barriers in financial education systems drive the racial wealth gap, but we shouldn't let a uh, lack of financial education contribute to these disparities. That's another reason why we want to have the Financial Literacy Task Force to help us identify data that will reveal potential inequalities in accessing financial education. So Representative Hirschauer, along with her colleagues, Representative Gazzardi and Senator Villanueva, who you'll hear from in just a little bit, are leading efforts in the General Assembly to help make sure that the Financial Literacy Task Force becomes a reality. We're making a lot of progress on making sure that the bill moves through the legislative process, both on the Senate side, where it's SB 1556, and on the House side, where it's HB 3131. But we need to hear your voices to make sure that legislators understand why this is so important. So if you'd like to share your story, visit Young Invincibles Story Hub at http younginvincibles.org forward slash financial dash literacy dash in Illinois. And we'll share that again later on in today's broadcast. Your voice really does matter. And so along those lines of storytelling to influence legislators, we're now going to hear from several young people who have been willing to share their experiences and opinions around financial education so let's welcome in Marvin, Kristen, and Rocky. So there, she is. there we go. Hey, Rocky. And I know Rocky might be having a little bit of internet challenges. So Rocky, we totally understand the nature of COVID and, and this Zoom reality that we live in. Um, yeah, but thank you. It's not a for virtual event until someone drops off and drops back on. Then we know it's a real party. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Um, so thank you, Marvin and Rocky and Kristen uh, for joining us. I just wanted to give a little bit of intro about who we have on our panel today. Marvin Slaughter is a University of Chicago graduate student. He's in his last quarter about to graduate and he's an a, active activist in the community and he's a member of Young Invincible's Young Advocates Board. We also have Kristen Ronning, who is a professional musician. She's a recent graduate and just started a full-time job this week. So congrats, Kristen. And uh, we also have uh, with us on the panel, Rocky Jones, who is a creative here in Chicago, and she's also a new mom. Um, Rocky is a member of our Young Advocates program as well. So thank you all for joining us uh, tonight and giving some time to hear your stories. Um, so what I want to do is just dive into a few questions. And if our audience has any questions for our panelists, please feel free to ask those in the chat. Um, but the first question I had for you all is just on a scale of one to 10, um, how would you rate your financial knowledge and why? What's keeping you from being a 10? I can kick this off. I consider myself to be a strong six. You know, I've managed to figure out how to slightly improve my credit score apply for a credit card, open a bank account. But when tax season rolls around, I am extremely dependent on TurboTax and I don't totally know what I'm doing. And I really have no clue what I'm doing in terms of retirement past, I probably should be saving for retirement. Thanks, Kristen. 
Um, are you able to hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. All right. Well, so I'm going to say that I am a five um, and I'm not proud about it, but um, especially like what Kristen was saying, like when tax season rolls around, I'm literally either on the phone with my father or I'm on YouTube trying to figure out the right way to go about um, financial literacy. And yeah, it's been a struggle. And because of the, you know, lack of uh, it being implemented in like high school and college, I'm a five. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, uh, I agree. Uh, five, <laughs> really middle of the road. You know, there's so much that it kind of encompasses financial knowledge, everything from, you know, personal budgeting and consumption choices and, and taxes and uh, financial planning for the future. And it's hard to financial plan when, you know, you can't get a job that pays you well enough to, to actually financial plan. So, um, yeah, but the biggest part is really just the taxes. Uh, our tax code is super difficult to understand. And I'll say this as a person that has tax preparing and like exit interviewing inter uh, experience. So, yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's definitely understandable. And I honestly, I, I think I have a few more years on y'all and I would say I'm a solid six as well. So <laughs> um, I, I was just going to say, I'm very far from being a young adult, but I, I feel the same way you all do about taxes for sure. Yeah, uh, definitely mystery, but we do have a uh, accountant on hand um, who you'll hear from a little bit later uh, and he will be available to answer questions that you might have. So um, the next question that I had for you all is what did you learn about personal finances when you were in undergrad or in high school and what do you wish you had learned? You might have lost Rocky. I guess I can kick this one off. Um, I guess in undergrad, I recall learning a lot about budgeting and kind of utilizing the free stuff that is associated with attending college. Um, my personal experience uh, in undergrad at UIC had me, you know, taking advantage of a lot of things, you know, the free entertainment, the free food, I took advantage of that very often. Um, but in addition to those things, you know, as a student, you would also take advantage of a lot of those discounted opportunities, you know, the discounts that come with the college ID uh, it, when you're shopping or going to restaurants. Um, I wish I learned more about like taxes or accepting loans, <laughs> uh, loan applications and things of that nature. Uh, and I mean, also reporting scholarship dollars. How exactly do you do it? What, <laughs> what exactly is it? It's very, very confusing to do. Um, that's a little bit about what I learned um, in undergrad and in high school, you know, we learned a little bit about credit cards and you're, you're supposed to have a good credit score, but not really how to get one. <laughs> um, you know, and the, some of the, the things that you should avoid or, or be careful about credit cards with. So um, yeah, that's, those are a few things that I, I learned and wish I learned. I definitely agree with Marvin. You know, I feel like my financial education was really lacking in my undergraduate. Um, actually in the like, classes I was required to take for to complete my degree, there was nothing related to finances. I took an elective entrepreneurship class about music. And all that I learned was I should start an LLC if I'm going to do any self-employed business it works so that I don't get sued as an individual, my business gets sued. But it was really disappointing because, you know, going into a creative field, so many people are going to be self-employed. They're going to need to be reporting their own taxes, budgeting. And we got none of those skills at all. And I also really wish we had talked about leases and contracts. You know, college is the first time a lot of students are going to be signing their first lease, paying rent for the first time. And institutions should be preparing those students for that. Completely agree. Um, and I think Rocky is back on. Rocky, if you wanted to share your response to just kind of what you learned when you were in school. Oh, we may have lost her, but we'll, we'll come back to you, Rocky. Um, I just wanted to move to the next question about um, who do you turn to for financial advice? So I know Rocky did mention a little bit ago that she asked her dad and you know called him up when she needed some help, but who all do you turn to and are there tools that you use to help you manage your budgets and finances? 
I can t- kick this one off since Marvin did the last time. Um, usually I turn to my parents, but you know, sometimes it's hard for them. Both of my parents work traditional jobs. They're both teachers. So especially with a lot of gig work and contract work, they can't really answer the questions that I have. I'm lucky that I have a friend in the industry who's 10 years older than me, but even he still doesn't know the answers to everything. So a lot of times I'm just kind of Googling and hoping I'm doing it right. I actually agree with Kristen. I am also a musician as well. So I do like a lot of contracting work. Um, And there's just a lot that I don't understand. So I definitely turn to um, my family. My brother's actually a professional musician too. And sometimes he's able to help me. Sometimes I have to rely on YouTube um, or videos, um, different content like that that could help. But also I know that there are apps like Mint and... um, I forgot the other app, but um, there are a lot of apps that help with budgeting for me. So um, although I don't always have the proper knowledge or language um, for uh, budgeting and, and like knowing the proper way to go about it, sometimes I rely on that. It helps sometimes and sometimes it does not. So. Yeah, I kind of have to agree with everything that I've heard personally. You know, I've turned to my parents for much of my financial advice. But I know from personal experience that many students, you know, they don't let their parents or guardians know when they're in a financial bind. Um, and there are also students that can't turn to their parents or guardians for assistance with financial stress or financial advice. Um, also, you know, your parents don't know everything. <laughs> uh, there is no, there is no uh, super easy way to kind of get through tax codes or how to file taxes and things of that nature. So even your parents might struggle with some of that information. Um, but in regards to some of the tools that I use to manage my finances, uh, you know, expense trackers, um, the the free credit, you know, credit reporting from like the credit cards that I have, and then also trying to make sure that, um, you know, I, I designate certain credit cards for certain expenses to kind of make sure that, you know, I have a, you know, I have a good tally of what I'm spending and where I'm spending it. Yeah, no, that's those are really helpful pieces of advice that you all provided. And, you know, the reality is our parents are, um, you know, as as Krista mentioned, they are working at a different time than what we're growing up in and and now kind of emerging into the workforce. So uh, the nature of work's changing and so are taxes and and how we manage our finances. So I I think that's really good insight about your parents. My next question was for Kristen. Uh, Kristen, I know you just started your new job. Again, congratulations. So can you tell us about the onboarding paperwork that you had to do when you started and if there was anything on it that kind of felt a little bit confusing? Yeah, of course. So I just started a new position and I'm going to be salaried for the first time in my life, which was totally different tax paperwork from a lot of the contract work I'm used to. Uh, All I had to fill out was a W-4 and then just some basic health insurance information. So I was really lucky that, you know, it mostly just was like, you know, am I a citizen, my social security number? Uh, I'm really lucky that because I'm now salaried, I'm not having to manage multiple revenue streams. So I got to skip the really confusing part where it's asking you how many streams of income you want to claim. One of the unfortunate things about this job is I don't have retirement benefits built in. So that's not going to be withheld from my stuff at all. So basically, I need to start a retirement account, start setting aside money on my own. And I did not get any resources about that for my job. Yeah, I mean, even when you're filling out W-4s for a traditional kind of nine to five, you know, when it comes to the exemptions and allowances, I know when I first started working, I was like, "Mm, one, two, I don't know. I just kind of filled it out. So (laughs) I'm glad that it doesn't sound like that was your experience, but um, it's definitely where some financial education can come into play. And definitely I've, I know for a fact, I've messed up on some tax forms before with the exemptions, just because I had no one to turn to, to ask about it. And I just kind of you know, it's kind of confusing jargon. It's not very clear language. And so I tried to do it to the best of my ability, but I found out later at tax season, oh no, I did that wrong. Yeah. And that's not when you want to find out. That's, it's not fun to get that huge bill. Um, Marvin, what about you? Um, I know that you do a lot of advocacy around just kind of economic security in general. Do you think there are other policies that um, should complement improved financial education for young adults? Oh, uh, that's a that's a good question. And uh, we can definitely go down the rabbit hole on a lot of different policies that 
uh, could potentially, you know, help young adults. But I guess I can just kind of go with one broad idea and that's kind of putting capital into their hands. I feel like, you know, a lot of information is 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 out there that we can kind of grasp, but, you know, putting capital into hands to making sure that, you know, students, young adults, pretty much anybody in America can, can afford to live here. Um, that's important. And also maybe trying to simplify the tax code, make it a little easier for, um, you know, us common people to understand so that, you know, we can actually like pay our taxes. It's not that people are trying to uh, get out on paying taxes. It's just that sometimes it can be so confusing that um, it, it makes it hard to do so. Those are great ideas. Um, and I know just to kind of make sure we stay on track with time, just had a couple of more questions. Um, so what do you all think is just the greatest challenge that young adults are facing, um, especially in light of COVID? Um, what do you think is the biggest financial challenge uh, and burden on your generation? Oh, can I can I tackle this one first? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, jobs that require certain years of experience, but only want to give you $15 an hour for pay. Um, you know, as a person who, you know, is is getting a master's at the University of Chicago and the sticker price on the university is is so high and, you know, getting out into the job market and you have jobs that are willing, that, that want to pay you $15,000 less than what my sticker price for my university is, is just, you know, <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. And that seems to be a common story amongst many college going students, unless if you're, you know, an engineer uh, or a nurse. <laughs> So, you know, you have a lot of other amazing, uh, you know, job opportunities and careers that you can pursue that you, you would hope to see uh, the, the compensation meet at least the, the debt ratio that you're going to be, you know, kind of getting when you, when you graduate. I'm going to build off of that sticker price. I think that student loans are going to really negatively impact our entire generation because, you know, a lot of jobs that people want now the standard is that four years bachelor's degree that maybe in the past it was just a high school diploma, but over time, the expectation has changed. Students are having to take out more and more loans and we're just gonna see, it's just gonna continue happening where young adults are gonna miss out on some milestones that they want, like buying a house, having children. They're not gonna be able to participate in those aspects of our society because they're so saddled with this debt. That is so true. Well, and um, I'm not sure if we lost Rocky, but again, she's a new mom to an uh, infant child. So the fact that she was even here and dressed and groomed is amazing. <laughs> That's not my experience as a mom too. Um, so thank you both for joining and for Rocky for joining and, and sharing your experiences. If there's kind of one thing that you would want kind of the Facebook world to know or YouTube um, to know about financial education, what would that be? I can't kick it off this time. Uh, my biggest piece of advice to other young people is if you have a chance to pursue your education without taking debt, please do it. You know, at 18, they are not going to be honest with you about the kind of debt that you're going to have for the rest of your life. And you can make just about any institution work for you. Give yourself the freedom you're going to appreciate four years down the line. I guess this is more so for my college goers, but uh, avoid student dorms if you can get an apartment off campus it most of the time it comes out to be a lot more cheap uh than actually living on campus and it's it's a way to avoid some of that debt that uh kristen was talking about great well thank you both again and i'll transition it back to representative hershauer thank you so much uh, just sitting and listening to um your wisdom is is really wonderful and to have the opportunity um, for you all to share your experiences and your thoughts with uh, with the greater Facebook virtual world, I think is so important. So I appreciate that. And I hope um, folks are really taking into account. I loved what you both said about accruing debt in college. I know even my generation, I think, was one of the first generations to start accruing that major debt in college. And uh, it's tough. Um, it, it takes a long time to pay off. I'll tell you that as a 42 year old person, <laughs> it takes a long time to pay off college loans. So I really liked what you both said about that. And thank you for joining us. I will, I do want to say somebody, um, in the comments, I thought it was important to, um, bring this out 
is, you know, to mention the fact that those who have wealth, those folks with wealth, they are able to pay folks to do their taxes. They don't have to, uh, you know, they have these advantages that, that not everyone has. So not everyone has an accountant, which is why this bill to study what we're learning in higher ed and, and to really um, focus on the task force for, any, for financial literacy could really change some lives, I think, if we're getting that sort of education out to the people. So I will um, let you both go. And Rocky, I know you're out there somewhere. Thank you for joining us. I am, will say goodbye by Martin, Marvin and by Kristen. All right, that was fabulous, Morgan. Um, that was a really great panel. Um, so what we have coming up next is a guest speaker. Um, let's see here. We have guest speaker Rebecca Maxey who is Director and Principal Investigator at the University of Chicago Financial Education Initiative. Rebecca has led the research and development of Fine Edge, I think I said that right, um, a, singu a single semester financial education course for high school students in Talking Sense, conversation cards developed to engage people in conversations about money. Oh, those are fabulous things, I can't wait. She's also an author of Everyday Mathematics. Rebecca earned a master's in education from Lesley University and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Bates College um, in my home state of Maine. Um, so I will bring up Rebecca. Welcome. Oh, I think you're on mute. Okay, am I here? <laughs> yeah, you're here. Thank you so much for the introduction, Representative Hershauer. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm so glad that you included the initiative in this event and around equity and the, and the impacts of financial education. So hello to everyone on Facebook who's watching. Um, that, and I have to say, I agree with you about the panel. I, that was really interesting hearing, you know, them share their stories. Um, and I appreciate how honest they are about their their financial knowledge and and you know, to be honest, I do this for a living and I'm definitely not a 10. Uh, <laughs> so I think you're always learning. So um, I really appreciated that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, financial education and kind of consequences of, of not having financial education and issues of equity. Um, so I, you you both have addressed this earlier, you know, that, that you know, personal finance, it, it's a difficult topic to approach even when times are flush and you know but as millions of americans are facing you know economic hardships and stress you know conversations that are already you know too often filled with shame and fear and and guilt and insecurity may feel almost impossible right now but you know given this this economic uncertainty that so many people are experiencing and will likely experience moving forward you know financial education is is really it's deeply relevant and, and a key topic for students to learn. So, you know, this knowledge is particularly uh, useful to high school students. And, you know, as students are moving on to institutions of higher learning or careers in this landscape that looks drastically different from, you know, what any of us have experienced in our lifetimes. Uh, so, you know, I, like thinking now, you know, it would be interesting to know how many people watching have had a course in financial education. And, you know, unfortunately my guess is that not many if you use the panel as, as, a, uh, as an example. So if you do get a, a moment, um, I believe Morgan put the blog of one of our former students, um, his name is Dan Bowie, uh, on the need for financial education. So his story is a powerful one. He took our uh, FinEdge course. And one thing that he mentioned in his blog is that a course like this is the only way we're going to get the information that we need. And, you know, currently that information isn't accessible to everyone. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to imagine a circumstance in which information, you know, that's in high demand would be a resource that's given to some and withheld from others. Uh, you know, and this unfortunately is the reality of the financial education landscape in the United States and more specifically in Illinois. So, you know, where you live should not determine whether or not you have access to financial education. And, and I really want to reiterate that, that it, it, your location should not determine access to financial education. And unfortunately, for many Illinois students, you know, the lack of access, they, they, they lack this access to financial education opportunities. So, 
instead of talking about the downside, I like to be positive uh, of not having financial education. I want to flip it. So imagine what we can achieve by having financial education. So imagine how your life might be different. If you take a minute to think about, you know, maybe some of the, the, the pitfalls or the negative experiences you've had. So, you know, here are some ways that students are positively impacted by financial education. So several studies have compared students from states with financial education requirements to peers, you know, from states with no such requirement at all. And they found that those students who completed a financial education course or class have higher credit scores and lower rates of delinquency on open accounts. So great news. Um, there was a study done recently at um, University of Wisconsin-Madison that found that state financial education mandates are associated with a uh, decreased likelihood of costly payday loan borrowing, which is huge. Uh, and another study examined financial behaviors and dispositions of college students and found that those who had completed a required financial literacy course in high school were more likely to save they're less likely to max out their credit cards and they're less likely to miss credit card payments and more likely to pay off their credit card bill in full each month, which ends up saving you a tremendous amount of money. So, you know, one important theme in these research studies is that students must actually have to take a financial education course in order for these benefits to be seen. And, you know, but th there's all kinds of information out there about the, that elective courses, if it's only offered as a choice, as an elective, they don't appear to have the same um, positive effect as a mandated course. So, um, you know, essentially, if you're just simply adopting something like, or paying lip service and just saying, okay, we're gonna offer a course, you know, it, it, it's not enough that students really need to actually take a course and gain the necessary knowledge to change their attitudes and behaviors. So part of our work at the initiative is to move the field of financial education forward. And in order you know, to, to do that, we need to figure out where do gaps exist and you know, where can we be most helpful? So we really studied um, th this landscape closely. And so what we found was kind of interesting. So when financial education is only offered as a supplement, like something like an after school program or like a one type event, one you know, on a weekend, it excludes lots of students, particularly those students who need to work after school or on weekends. So that's a problem right there. The, you know, when it's required to be offered, but it's only offered as an elective or a seminar type class, not all students have access. So you know, there might be graduation, uh, you know, sort of given requirements or coursework concerns, and so it's not always possible for students to fit that in their schedule. And we also noticed that girls were less likely to take the course um, when it was an elective, particularly when it was an elective that was sort of buried in a math class um, because it was often tied to math and there's still some he hesitancy uh, among females to take math classes. Now, when it's mandated as a course, everyone receives access and they, and they must take the course to graduate. So a single class you know, really ensures that the concepts and the skills found in you know, state standards are a part of this sort of core content taught to students. So there's clear expectations, there's course materials, you know, there's rigor, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it, it are clearly articulates what students need, need to learn, you know, and how they'll be graded. So it's a, it's a real, um, uh, you know, kind of wall-to-wall -wall course that's taken seriously. So it, it's something that's focused um, and it provides a, a better, more equitable experience um, and outcomes for, for students. So. Um, you know, the, the question around equity, I talked about it a little bit here, but, and, and Morgan, you mentioned this as well, that, you know, financial education, you know, is an important piece um, in creating a more equitable financial system, um, you know, because we can't change what we don't understand, right? And, and we, don't, we can't understand what we aren't taught. And, but financial education isn't enough to solve this sort of deep systemic, these deep systemic problems in our financial system. So, you know, we acknowledge that there are limits, right, to financial education. It is not the magic cure, um, but, you know, we believe teaching about inequities in the financial system is critical piece, you know, in, in creating a more equitable financial future for those that have been left behind. And so, you know, not every, we know not everybody starts out on, on the same financial playing field and, you know, financial education can, can help people understand 
systemic inequities. Um, you know, there's centuries of inherited wealth and discriminatory policies in housing and, and lending, you know, and different job, um, uh, sorry, and, and job opportunities and pay, you know, it was created this situation, you know, in which, you know, people of color, particularly black Americans are, are fighting an uphill battle for financial stability. Uh, you know, and research really indicates that students who are more aware of these inequities, you know, they face better outcomes, um, you know, perhaps because they're less likely to blame, you know, their individual failures and they, and they feel empowered to act. Um, you know, financial education can also be a lever for uh, policy change by fostering uh, understanding about this inequitable financial system. So it really, you know, as I mentioned, empowers people to advocate for a more equitable one. So, you know, again, when students have this understanding of the system, and the, and the challenges it creates for the, them and their families and their communities, they're better prepared to advocate. Um, and, you know, people really deserve the skills necessary to shape their financial lives and really improve their financial well-being. And so, you know, we want to ensure that, that every student has access to, to relevant um, financial education and, and, you know, become informed decision makers. So, you know, we feel, we really feel strongly we need to prioritize um, high quality financial education um, and provide students with the knowledge they need to make these crucial decisions down the road. And, you know, Illinois students deserve a bright financial future. Uh, they deserve to have the knowledge and the skills to navigate this complex financial world. And, you know, research shows us that financial education can give the students the necessary knowledge and skills, but, you know, only if students are given the opportunity to learn it in school. Uh, and so, so we think it's time for Illinois to recognize the importance of this. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. That was a really wonderful um, information in there. And I think our hope is that this task force is the first step in that ultimate goal of, of bringing comprehensive financial literacy courses to, to Illinois. So um, you laid out the whole picture for us from beginning, <laughs> beginning to end. That was fabulous. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Did you have questions, Morgan? Do we for Rebecca? Are we looking? I'm looking in the chat um, to see if there are any. I don't see any in the chat right now, but one question I did have for you, Rebecca, is, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially at the higher education level, what are some ideas that you have for helping make sure that graduates from two and four year schools uh, have what they need to navigate complicated finances? Yeah, so I think um, what's hard right now is that you have, you know, we're trying to get something in high school, but we've missed a whole generation or many generations. Um, and so, we, we've noticed a trend that more colleges um, are starting to look at, you know, financial wellness as a part of, you know, overall wellness and looking at how can they address this. So we've had conversations as well, you know, even with our own university, about how can we better address this, you know, for students that are, are currently enrolled? Because like, you know, like you said, they, they, they haven't had access. There are so many issues around loans. And um, we heard tonight, you know, taxes and getting a job and, um, and so, yeah, I, so I think there is a place for this in, in you know, two and four year institutions as well. Great. Anything else that you would want to share, just kind of a final takeaway? Um, <laughs> no, I just, I, 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 so great already. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I so appreciated hearing, um, Rocky and, and Marvin and Kristen's stories, um, you know, their, their, uh, you know, information and, and their stories just because it's, this is what's happening. I mean, this is what's out there and, you know, you can hear me talk about it, but to hear their reality, I mean, this is what, this is where we're at and we really need to figure this out. So that you know, we don't just keep creating generations of people who don't have this knowledge and information. And they've done an amazing job on their own of figuring this out. And um, but you know, but but we really need to to do a better job of of finding a way to provide them this information so that they can navigate the the system with with you know a little more ease and more confidence. Absolutely. And I will um, say we've put some things in the chat. Um, some links to the blog that you mentioned, um, a link to a teacher toolkit, which looks really excellent um, for some guidance for um, 
reaching out about curriculum and things like that. So those links are in the chat for folks if you're interested in learning more. Okay, well, thank you, Rebecca, for um, spending some time with us tonight and sharing your wealth of expertise. Um, and, you know, we are working really hard to make sure that um, HB 3131 passes so that um, through and we can get started on this task force and, and get to work. We appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night, Rebecca. Thanks. You too. Bye, Morgan. <laughs> okay. We, sorry, I'm the one. There we go. Okay. <laughs> it's hard doing double duty. So um, up next, we have my friend and colleague in the General Assembly, Representative Will Gazzardi. Um, Representative Gazzardi represents the 39th District and has served in the General Assembly since January of 2015. He is currently the chair of the Prescription Drug Affordability Committee and the Housing Committee, and I sit on both of those. And I must say he's a fantastic chairperson and a really great mentor. He is also a co-sponsor of HB 3131. And I am going to pull him up right now. Welcome, Representative Gazzardi. Hi, good evening. It's so good to see you. It's nice to have you here. Thank you for coming. Um, to share your perspective on this piece of legislation. So, um, you know, you were the one who sort of let me know that this legislation was on the horizon and introduced me to Morgan and the Young Invincible. So thank you for doing that. Um, can I ask, I'll ask a few questions. So why do you feel like financial education is important right now, especially for people facing systemic barriers um, in the labor and financial systems? Yeah, I mean, I think we've heard a lot about that this evening so far. And um, just to say, um, I'm going to answer that question by way of a sort of meandering <laughs> a few <laughs> other remarks. Nothing less from you, Representative. Yeah. What people said, I mean, so much of it just jumped out to me. And I think it's, it addresses exactly this question of why we need this right now. I mean, first of all, to say that, like, um, I, I feel like I'm one of the generations that got missed in this area, right? Um, I, I turned 34 this year and I just two weeks ago paid out my student loans um, and have now that I, I'm not paying my student loans every month, I'm like, well, I should save for retirement. How do you do that? What's an IRA? So, um, yeah. And, you know, I think I uh, come to this with so many more advantages than some of the folks we heard from earlier. Right. First of all, just like the systemic advantages of being white and male. Um, but then also, I think that um, the generation that's coming behind the millennial to Gen Z age folks are facing so many structural obstacles. First of all, the, the crisis in the economy right now because of the pandemic is obviously catastrophic. But also, I think there's a, a change in the nature of work that like traditional employment. I mean, we heard from the folks who spoke. Um, uh, maybe one of those three people who was speaking had like a traditional nine to five with a salary, right? Like employers are trying to shirk those responsibilities of traditional employment by sort of gigifying the economy and treating people like contractors. And that puts so much more of the financial onus. I mean, it's a problem for a lot of reasons, but a big one is that the onus of managing your finances, doing your withholdings, paying your taxes, doing your budgeting, instead of that being coming from the employer side, it all falls on you. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that so many people coming up into the workforce right now are exposed to that kind of employment uh, situation really creates an added vulnerability on top of the challenges facing uh, people of color who don't have the sort of structural and historic advantages that, uh, that someone like me does. Absolutely. Um, I feel as though with student loan debt, it's such a huge, huge issue. Something in my household, my my husband graduated with zero debt, like mm -hmm. all through graduate school too. He had zero debt. And then he married me. <laughs> and, I, you know, the debt came with the person. So mm -hmm. it's something that our family just, you know, barely pays off before our oldest goes to college. So it, it's such a key, key issue that folks are facing right now. Um, let's see, we have a few other questions about the bill. Um, you know, what would you like to see come out of this bill? You know, what, in, what does a dream task force look like or a dream at the end? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I think um, 
there's this is clearly a missing piece, uh, right? Financial literacy is clearly a, a gap that needs to be filled. And how, what the gap looks like, who's experiencing it most, and how we can address those populations and fill that gap, like that's what we need to be figuring out with this task force. And you know, one thing I love about this task force is that they have a report due at the end of the year. It's like chop, chop, let's get this stuff figured out, um, find the needs so that we can launch right into meeting them. Um, and you know, I, I something that Rebecca just said that um, I wanted to sort of flip it around its head when she said it. Uh, I mean, it's a great point, but she said, you know, financial literacy isn't a silver bullet, right? That there's all these other profound sort of equity issues that are facing people, particularly people of color and younger people in the job market. Um, but I want to like turn that around a little bit, just to say, um, you know, I've worked a lot in my career in the legislature on these sort of equity issues. You know, I was the sponsor of the bill to raise the minimum wage. I worked closely with the folks who passed the legislation recently capping the interest rate on those uh, payday lending uh, products that we just yep. heard about a minute ago. I helped pass the Student Loan Bill of Rights, uh, housing issues, you know, these equity things are deeply important to me. Um, but they only go so far without the literacy and education piece, right? It may not be a silver bullet on its own, but without the knowledge of how to navigate these systems, um, you know, we can pass all the structural change in the world and it's never going to really take hold if the people who are, um, who are most affected by these structures don't have the education and the tools to, to see the way clear of it. So I think it's a really critical piece and I'm really optimistic about the bill about getting it passed, about getting this task force in and getting those findings and figuring out where the gaps are and coming back to the legislature with a plan to, to meet them. Yes, it's an exciting process. And I'll say when Morgan and I took it to the Economic um, Opportunity and Equity um, Committee, people, the folks on that committee were so excited about it. Did you feel that way, Morgan? They were, um, it was the best bill I ran <laughs> um, during deadline week. It, it was met with, you know, zero opposition. It passed and bipartisan. And um, I just think it's a it's an issue that speaks to everyone. So I, I feel a lot of good momentum with it. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, um, well, Morgan, you're lucky to have a great sponsor and Representative Hirschauer and Representative Hirschauer, you're lucky to have amazing advocates in Morgan and Young Invincibles. Uh, I, yeah, I feel like it's more the other way. I was sort of untested when <laughs> when Morgan came to me. I was the untested freshman, but we're working through it. It's been good. Any and, other parting thoughts? Oh, thanks, Morgan. Okay. Parting thoughts on the bill, Rep? Um, yeah, just thank you for your work on it and your leadership here. And um, hopefully this is uh, the beginning of uh, a sort of comprehensive look at this issue in the legislature. And I'll be happy to support you every step of the way. Fabulous. Yeah, I, this is going to be a multi-year takeover of higher education that we're going to do together. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting. Thank um, you for your time tonight, Representative. We appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. See you later. Have a good night. Okay, um, and then next we have, moving right along, we have a video um, from the Senate sponsor, from Senator Selena Villanueva from the 11th District. She couldn't be with us tonight, um, but she's here to share her perspective. And bear with me one moment. Hello, oh, I'm look. State Senator Selena Villanueva of the 11th District and the Senate sponsor of the Equity Through Financial Literacy Task Force. For me, as a legislator and a former community organizer, I tend to look at legislation through the lenses of the people in my community, through their lived experience, the people that I represent, because their stories are often very similar to my own. I'm the daughter of immigrant parents. I come from a working class family. So when the opportunity to champion the Financial Literacy Task Force came about, I jumped at it. And the reality is this, very often, it's communities of color, working class and low income communities that are preyed upon because of their lack of education around financial literacy. I come from a family that didn't really understand retirement plans or understand the stock market. And so it's personal to me because I want our students, our young people moving forward to have a foundational education around financial literacy so that they can be better equipped to move forward in their futures. 
So I'm so happy to be able to be the Senate sponsor of this bill to really start get the ball, getting the ball rolling on this issue and hopefully, hopefully to be able to see some real efforts being made in order to ensure that our students get the education on financial literacy that they need and that they deserve. Oh, I think you're on mute. See, it's not a party till I put myself on mute. I'm so glad uh, Senator Villanueva could join us um, in that way. She's doing a lot of important work on the Senate side. And remind me that Senate bill number, what is it? Um, 1556. Exactly. Yep. And okay. we uh, anticipate that it'll be heard next week in the Human Rights Committee on the Senate side. So just as another plug, we need to hear voices from young adults and others who've been impacted by a lack of financial education or just really believe in financial education. So visit Young Invincible Story Hub to submit your story on um, how financial education has impacted you. Yes, I just put a link up um, on the screen. And again, if you scroll through the comments, that link is there for you to share your story and also fill out a witness slip um, on the Senate bill as, if, as a proponent. That's always really helpful to get as many proponents as we can as we're going into committee. So those are some ways you can help move this forward on the Senate side. Fabulous. And then we're coming to our final um, speaker of the night. Um, which I'm really excited about this because a lot of folks on the panel were mentioning questions about taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and tonight we have guest speaker, CPA, uh, Jeff Badu. He is the founder and CEO of Badu Tax Services. Um, he's a certified public accountant, which I said, licensed in the state of Illinois with several years of tax experience, including preparing taxes for individuals and small businesses. I have a feeling that he has a lot of um, information he can give us and he can help us with um, strategic planning solutions and our taxes. I'm really excited um, to bring Jeff up into the stream. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Definitely appreciate it. Thank you. Well, um, I just want to encourage our Facebook and YouTube audience, if you have any questions, to please throw them in the chat and I can definitely relay them to Jeff. But in the meantime, I just had a few questions for you that um, young adults might have, especially in the middle of tax season. Um, so one, can you just clarify for us when are taxes due? Yeah, so the tax deadline for 2021 um, basically has been extended to May 17th. So for 2020 tax returns that are due in 2021, they're due on May 17, 2021. And just from your experience, and it's good to hear that uh, you know, that's been extended, especially with all the complications people are facing um, in light of COVID. Um, but can you share with us from your experience, what are some of the common missteps that you see young adults in particular, but in anybody making um, when it comes to filing their taxes or just financial capability in general? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the biggest mistake I see is going at it alone. So taxes are so complicated that Albert Einstein once said that the most complicated thing on the planet is the income tax. And so even if you have software such as TurboTax, you know, um, anything you can use to help you, you still need that hands on, you know, hand holding a bit from somebody who is an expert. And you know, I heard some comments earlier that only the quote unquote wealthy may be able to afford an accountant. And I would say that not necessarily. I mean, in our firm, you know, our prices are pretty reasonable. We pretty much work with anybody. And depending on the scope of the service, that ultimately determines the price. So, yeah, it is something you have to invest in. Right? It is an investment in having a professional by your side to help you navigate through the lenses of taxes, get you all the deductions, loopholes. Um, and get you a nice and accurate tax return file. So, yeah, I, I think in kind of talking about those deductions, um, there are so many tax credits that people aren't necessarily aware of, like the earned income tax credit um, that's available um, to help people who are working class and, and um, wanting to advance in their financial future. Can you share with us some of those tax credits, especially ones that might have changed um, temporarily in light of COVID? Yeah, so there is the earned income credit, which, um, for lack of a better term, are for low income uh, workers. 
So if somebody works a job where they have a business and they ultimately, you know, fall below a certain um, income number, then they qualify for the earned income credit. The more dependents you have, the more the credit is. Then for the parents out there, there's a child tax credit, which is a credit for someone who has a child. Um, it used to be 2000 and then, well, it used to be 1000 back in the day, then it moved to 2000 and now they're moving it up to about $3,600 per child. You know, that's under the age of, um, you know, like a, a toddler, basically, let's call it. So that's for someone who has a child. And then they have the American Opportunity Tax Credit. That's for the college students that's out there. That's a $1,000 refundable credit, meaning you can get a tax refund even if you don't have any income. Um, and then there's the Recovery Rebate Credit. That's the stimulus checks for them. And those are the 1,200, 600, or 1,400. There's three stimulus checks that's out there now. So if you didn't receive it in the first, um, you know, during last year, then you can actually get it the first and the second one um, as a recovery rebate credit on your 2020 income tax return. Great. And kind of along those lines, too, um, I know some people are concerned about unemployment insurance. If they've received unemployment insurance in the 2020 tax year, is that how should they report that on their taxes? Is it taxable? Yeah. So unemployment historically has always been taxable. But under the new administration, they did release a pretty nice rule where um, up to $10,200 of unemployment is not taxable. You know, it's unheard of. I mean, it, there's so much free money being thrown around. It's, it's crazy. You know, so um, $10,200 of unemployment is not taxable. And that's per individual um, in the household. And yeah, so, you know, I basically... Anything that's above that is taxable in full, you know, and I can imagine they'll probably come up with something that's even more than the 10,200. And um, one question that Marvin asked, I think, during our panel was, uh, you know, like even scholarships. So for young adults that might have a scholarship in college, um, what does that look like when it comes to tax season? Should they be reporting that on their taxes also? I mean, ultimately, um, I say report everything, right? So scholarships would go on the 1098T, um, T stands for tuition form. Mm -hmm. And that shows the scholarships, the payments made, you know, with tuition and everything like that. They're not really taxable because scholarships are meant for a specific purpose. Um, so yeah, definitely go ahead and claim it when you file your tax return, but it's not necessarily taxable. Okay. So that's good news. And I think it's good advice. Um, and I know some young adults feel like they, uh, you know, have that shame that uh, Rebecca talked about earlier when it comes to finances in general. Um, and sometimes that's if they have back taxes. So um, one of my last questions is just what should you do if you owe back taxes? Well, first thing you might want to do is pray. Um, and the second thing you might want to do is basically First and foremost, the best way to solve any problem on the planet is to understand what the problem is to begin with, meaning the magnitude, the specifics. How much do you owe, right? What year is it related to? Have you pulled an IRS transcript on the irs.gov slash transcripts website to see what's there? Have you talked to a representative at the IRS? What have you done to get rid of those back taxes? So I would definitely take some initiative. And I know it can be scary, you know, when you owe, um, you know, a big government agency such as the IRS, it's definitely not an easy thing. Um, but at the same time, one thing I've learned about the IRS, if you're willing to work with them, they're willing to work with you. They are nice people. They are humans after all, you know. Um, so basically what I would recommend is gain full transparency of the issue. And then if you do, if you really need some extra help, reach out to you know, a firm like ours where we represent you in front of the IRS, whether it's an audit, uh, whether it's just doing a, um, they call it offer and compromise, where we can settle your tax debt for a much lower amount you know, due to your financial situation. Or we can do a payment plan at worst that can get you in a nice um, affordable monthly payment plan. 
So thank you for that. And we have about a minute left. So if we can just get to the last question on the chat, um, Michelle asked, what is the best way to choose an affordable count? So if you can just sum that up and then uh, we'll close out uh, with Representative Hershauer. Yeah, I mean, honestly, you have to, you pay, you get what you pay for. So I'm an investor. I'm actually a real estate investor as well. So one thing that I always, you know, recommend is pick somebody who can be a great investment. Research them, right? Get to know about them. For example, for me, I have a website called jeffbadu.com, and that's why I post a lot of free financial resources. So with that being said, just really understand what you're investing in, and I guarantee you the return on your money is going to be probably five to ten times more than what you put in. Great. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. I'm sure you've been busy learning all these new, <laughs> there's been a lot of changes in tax code and law recently, so I'm sure you've been busy. Thanks for joining for sure. us. Thank and you. thanks for all that advice. All right, have a great night. Okay, so that wraps us up right on time. Um, I thought that this was really great, um, Morgan. Thank you for helping to pull together um, the panel i'm just checking the chat um in the chat it's it says to clarify the 1098t is only required to include scholarships that cover tuition any fees that are required for enrollment and course materials required for a student to be enrolled not scholarships that would cover room and board and any other miscellaneous expenses oh did you pop on jeff to say yes <laughs> Yeah, I mean, technically yeah. it can't cover room and board, but let's just say 99% of scholarships aren't really taxable regardless of what, you know, what's out there. Yeah. And then you also just recommend it's always good to report everything. Yeah. I mean, you, you never want them knocking on your door, I'll tell you. Right. That. Right. Right. Good <laughs> advice. Good advice. All right. Again, have a good night, Jeff. Thanks. Um, all right, so I think we just wanna leave you um, with a few calls to action because we've heard um, from our panelists, we've heard from experts um, and my colleague representatives, um, Representative Gazzardi and uh, Senator Villanueva, how important um, this legislation is because we really need to examine our financial literacy curriculum in the state. Um, and this is our first step to making some real structural change that I think is necessary. So um, the Young Invincibles website is scrolling on the bottom. I'm gonna pop up, there it is right there. Um, I just wanna pop up the share your story, um, share your financial literacy story on Young Invincibles and, and that will help us as we move legislation forward. And uh, fill out a witness slip if you want. It's takes two seconds and it's really um, helpful for legislators. So do you want to add anything else, Morgan, before we pop off? No, just thank everyone for joining tonight. Thank you, Representative Hershauer, for being a champion and um, to Representative Gazzardi and Senator Villanueva. Um, like you've said, this is really important legislation and I'm, I'm looking forward to what can come out of it. Me too. And it is not hard to be a champion for all the young folks I've met in, in Illinois. I really feel as though, I sound like an old person saying this, but our state is in really excellent hands with um, all the young folks I'm meeting through you and the Young Invincibles and through my work. Um, so my job right now is just to hold the course steady so that when you folks need to take over for me, it's okay, because um, you have a lot of wonderful expertise to share. So with that, I think um, we will sign off. So thank you, Morgan. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, and I will end the stream. <laughs> All right. Bye, Morgan. Bye.